some new toys have arrived. Let's see. Look at these bad boys. So these are my custom STM32 dev boards that I got made up. Uh, thanks to JLC PCB for these. Um, and yeah, they look really good. So I'm super nervous about this. <laughs> I have no reason to be nervous, but I am. Um, I just want them to work. And I'll be really happy if they do work. Um, all I got to do is solder on some header pins, you know, plug in a little programmer, see if I can write some code for it. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm really nervous, <laughs> but I'm super excited. <laughs> these are awesome. All right, let's get to it. This video is sponsored by JLC PCB. More about them later. So the first thing to do here is a little bit of assembly. Uh, obviously all the parts came assembled from the factory, um, except for the header pins. So no big deal. You can just put the header pins on the same way I always do. Um, usually I like to plug them into a breadboard without them attached and then solder them in place with the breadboard holding everything uh, there. So it means it's gonna be nice and square. It'll be easy to plug into a breadboard in the future. Um, then you just need to flip it over to do the programming header on top and that's really the assembly done So pretty much ready to go and um, just need to be able to program it and write some code for it With that said programming one of these boards is a little bit more complicated or a little bit more difficult than programming an Arduino You'll notice there's no USB port on this like you'd expect to have with an Arduino board um, ST M chips uh, require a separate device called an ST-Link, which is this little uh, green programming dongle thing. Um, so you plug this dongle into your computer and then use the little header pins to connect it to the board, and then that's how you can program the chip. Um, I'm not gonna get into the specifics about why you have to do this, but this is kind of more of the grown-up way of doing it. Um, with Arduino boards, the there's you know, nice stuff that they've built into them to mean that you just need to plug a USB in and it'll just work. Um, there are STM dev boards that exist that you can just plug a USB in. Effectively, they have the ST-Link programmer built onto the board uh, itself. But this is a very DIY kit, and I don't want any of that extra stuff. I really just want this to be a really simple little compute module that I can plug into other things. So I'm perfectly happy to program them with the little programmer. Now, the next step is really just to plug it in and write the code and, and make it work. Um, now, this part caught me off. Uh, I found some great online samples and some um, some libraries and stuff that I can use, but I was running into a strange issue um, that I couldn't really solve uh, at first that was, that was basically stopping the board from working. So at that point, I wasn't really sure if it was my code or if it was something in the setup wrong or something in the hardware wrong, um, but we did figure it out. Um, so yeah, let's have a look at that. But first, uh, let's hear from this video sponsor. JLC PCB is a modern platform for PCB manufacturing and assembly. I've been using JLC PCB for a while now, and honestly, I've been really, really impressed with them. Um, their shipping times are fast, their manufacturing times are even faster, and the last PCBs I got made got manufactured and shipped all the way from China to Ireland in less than five days. One of my favorite features is their built-in parts library where you can check out the parts are in stock that you want, you can spec them, and you can see everything about them before you buy them. Um, it's really fantastic and I find it really, really useful. So check out JLC PCB at the link in the description. Thanks to JLC PCB for supporting the channel and providing the boards for this project. Okay, we've made some progress. Um, I have it working now, so I click on the power. Hey, we get our LED blinking, so this is just the... I call this the, the hello world of embedded programming, blinking and LED. Um, so we had some trouble. The chip wouldn't boot. It took me a little while to diagnose it, so I put some debug statements in the code, and I was able to see that it was basically failing trying to configure the clock. Um, the reason why it was failing was, well, I think my theory is so far, is that I've got the wrong oscillator in here. So this, this is the square chip here is the stm32 and this little rectangle is the oscillator the crystal oscillator so i made a mistake reading the data sheet and the there's basically two external oscillator pins on this chip labeled osc32 in and out um so the clue i should have noticed from 32 normally it's just osc in and out and um, so the 32 actually specif specifies that for this package there is no osc uh, this is just OSC32, which means that it doesn't support the high-speed external oscillator, which I was trying to use, which is this 8 megahertz chip 
it only supports an inter an external low speed oscillator which is a precisely timed 32 kilohertz oscillator so that's why it's not working there is no high speed external input for this so the chip was fi failing for that and this obviously won't work as a low speed external because it's an 8 megahertz chip so basically i need to remove this i'm going to what i'm going to do is i'm going to remove this i'm going to try and get a, a 32 kilohertz chip that's the same footprint solder it on by hand and just see does that work and if that does work then i know for my v2 board that's what i need to do this still works the reason why this is working now is because i've been able to make it work with the internal oscillators and um, so that's fine but yeah i'm gonna do that for the external oscillator and we're gonna see uh, if i can get that fixed because that'd be cool so that i can actually have precise timing with it so i just want to jump in and talk a little bit more about this clock thing because uh, it's a little bit you know nuanced and i found this piece of software uh, that is really helpful so this is a uh, cube mx stm32 cube mx uh, software from stm themselves or st themselves and what this allows you to do is this is basically a configuration tool that you can use uh, for pretty much every chip that st make so you can or well, pretty much every stm 32 chip so there's the 32 f's l's all sorts of different ones you can use them all in this uh, and what they do is they give you this graphical way where you can visualize the chip with all of its pins and you can go through all of the different functions that are available on the chip and you can configure all this stuff click a button and it will spit out code that you can then use to initialize your chips uh, the trouble with my system is so i actually knew about this software before um, a good friend of mine who's a professional at this stuff recommended this to me ages ago um but for what i'm doing with rust this isn't super helpful because it won't generate the output files but what it does help with is I can use this just as a tool to visualize everything and see what's going on with different pins. So if I go in here, I have this ORCC, which is basically how you configure the clocks. And you can see here, I can see all the different clocks that are available to me. So if I gone through this and say, clicked to enable the high speed clock here, I would have seen that the high speed clock on this particular package is limited to this uh, clock in pin, which won't accept the input of like a crystal resonator, which is what I'm trying to use. It'll accept the input at precisely timed clock module input, basically. So it'll take an external input clock. So the module you have to have can't just be a resonator. It has to be something that actually is doing the clocking itself, but it'll accept that as a high speed input. It won't accept the resonator input for the high speed. So that's, I would have known this. And this is in the data sheet. Uh, I did read it in the data sheet, but unfortunately I just didn't understand what it meant and completely ignored it. Um, we can see then here, if we disable that and we go to enable the low speed oscillator, you can see that that highlights these two pins here, which I mentioned before, OSC32 in and out. And those are the pins that I have my eight megahertz resonator connected to at the moment. And of course that doesn't work. So my new, I actually tried to solder off the old one to get a different one that would fit, couldn't do that. So I've actually just ordered new boards to come that'll have this resonator on, on board. But that does bring me to the next point because it turns out that this isn't actually going to be the most useful thing in the world for me. I kind of could have just left this out of the design. It will be functional, but it might not be as useful as I thought. So I mentioned before that if you just use like the internal, internally timed clocks of the chip, they can fluctuate. They're not so not super accurate. Temperature and stuff can affect them. So you want to use an external clock to get a good, accurate clock signal, which means if you're doing things with precise timing, it'll be accurate. But it turns out that the internal chip uh, timers are actually pretty good. The internal oscillators are pretty decent. So unless you're doing very specific things, um, USB communication is one thing or audio work, it probably is going to work just fine. Um, so I probably went a bit overboard. But one other really interesting thing about this is, so my friend who does this professionally has said that one of the things he struggles with sometimes is just setting up the clocks because they could be some, there could be some nuances in how they're set up and they are quite complicated. So aside from the software, just giving you these pinouts, it can also give you this monstrosity here, which is basically the clock diagram for the entire chip. So this shows you all the different clocks that are set up. You can see here we have our LSE or uh, low speed external uh, setup, um, and you can see what this does. And you can also then see the internal clocks here. You can see the external clock here. We see that's disabled. 
and then there's all this mess of how they set up and then at the end over here these are all the different types of clocks that uh, come out so you've got these uh, peripheral clocks timer clocks and then the system like the core clocks and all this sort of stuff so there's there's a ton of stuff that all gets derived down from the different clocks you set up what you may notice in this diagram is that this branch here for the lse isn't actually collected to the rest of these internal system clocks um, and the reason for that is that this clock is actually used for powering this thing here, which is called the RTC, which is a real-time clock. So the real-time clock is basically what can give you accurate timing of like time, the passage of time, so like seconds, minutes, whatever, that kind of thing. So if you need to accurately time things, you want to use this RTC. But for the internal workings of your chip, the, like what it actually operates at, the frequency it actually operates at, um, you're going to be relying on this 16 megahertz unless you're using an external module like I talked about a second ago. So it turns out that by me implementing this uh, other one, which I've done, so my new boards that will come, the V2 boards will actually have that working. So I could use the real-time clock if I wanted to on those boards, but that's not really going to be super useful maybe. So it is what it is. Uh, I, I done goofed a little bit, but it's not really going to make it. It's not, not any harm. I'll have this function available to me if I choose that I want to use it. Uh, and for everything else, I'll just be using the uh, internal resident, the internal uh, oscillator, which for most things should be pretty fine. Um, but I just wanted to highlight this because even if you're not using the kind of normal ST, you know, what their pipelines they want and program it in C, I'm using this Rust toolchain pipeline, which is a little bit... Um, a little bit different uh, so this won't generate any code for me but it's still really useful to be able to you know go through the pins and see you know what they're wired up to do uh, and be able to figure out what they can actually do and it also means that you don't have to trawl through the data sheet to try and find this information because all this information is in the data sheet it's just somewhat difficult to understand sometimes especially like me if you don't really know what's going on you're just kind of throwing yourself into this so that's my pro tip uh, for doing this um so yeah I think next we're probably going to look a little bit about how I've set up the code and stuff like that, uh, my programming environment, which I'm super excited to show you guys because it's actually really, really cool. And I'm really, really happy with it. So let's look at that next. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the programming environment that I have set up for this, uh, which I'm super, super happy with. So as I mentioned, I'm using Rust to program this, which uh, is probably a bit of an odd choice. Uh, I've been learning a bit of Rust recently and I really like it. And Rust is perfectly set up to target uh, ARM architecture, which is what our chip runs on. So in theory, there's no reason why it shouldn't compile down and uh, run on this chip, and it does. And as it happens, uh, some very enterprising people have already gone out ahead and written a bunch of HAL uh, libraries to support the various chips. So we're using R1 up here, which is stm 32 l 4 and then XX, because it'll work for a bunch of the different variations of this chip. Um, and we're using that basically is what gives us our nice hardware abstraction layer um, that we can use. Uh, we also have some interesting things. So we've got um, this RTT target thing, which basically lets us interface with uh, the chip when it's running over the RTT uh, protocol, which allows us to do debugging and get logs out of it and stuff like that, which is really cool. Um, and there's obviously some other libraries up here, which are to support the Cortex-M itself. So I cobbled all this together from uh, a blog post I found, which I'll link in the description, and also the actual library itself, the HAL library itself, has a bunch of example code in it, and you can find it there. Um, I'll also show this code, I'll provide uh, a link uh, in the description as well, where you can uh, have a look at this code yourself uh, and mess around with it. Um, so yeah, it's pretty simple. I'm not going to go through what the code really does. I just want to show the kind of tools around it. Um, and if you follow, most of the tooling is set up in a few different files. There's this cargo config file, cargo.toml and embed.toml and the memory file. So between all that stuff, it sets up basically all the tools you need. Uh, you just need to install a couple of packages and it just kind of works. I'm running on a Mac here, so it might be different uh, with other platforms. But yeah, for me, it just worked nearly straight away, which was shocking once I tweaked a few things. So I have basically two ways I can run this. Uh, the first way here, I can run it using Cargo, which is the Rust um, package manager, and you, you can run Rust programs and stuff by like Cargo run. So in this case, I can do Cargo embed. And uh, so I also have my programmer connected here, which is the ST link, and that's connected to the chip. So when I run Cargo embed, it'll build a project It'll connect over RTT and it'll start uh, sending me back the debug statements, which uh, are these codes in here. 
and during the main loop of this program it'll show on and off which should match the led turning on and off if, if this if you could see that which you can't see it now but you'll see the log lines anyway so if i hit enter builds the package and there we go <laughs> so this spat out all of these config lines up here and now you'll see it's just running on off on off but that's it it's pretty simple so using the terminal really easy quick and easy program the chip write some code test it program the chip see the results on the screen really simple really straightforward love it um much smoother than working with uh arduino stuff even which is meant to be smooth and easy to use this is fantastic and um, so if i kill that um i can show you the other way i can interface this so i use vs code as my editor and uh there is the tool that i'm using that does most of like does all the uploading and stuff uh, is called or s probe or probe or s so what cargo does when you run it it actually executes this uh, probe or s software and that's what does all the work to communicate with your st link and do all the uploading and facilitates all that stuff so they also have an extension um, a vs code extension which wires up in uh, editor debugging which is fantastic so uh, in here now so i have you have like a config file you set up in here launch.json and you configure some stuff in it and then just click the basically click the go button and it'll work um so if i go here and click the play button and uh, so i'll set a breakpoint first throw it here click the play button and that's doing its thing and there we go it's already hit it uh, and here we've got our debug that's come and it stopped at this uh line here where i put my thing and you can use this exactly as you would debugging normally through anything it's a little bit less uh, polished than other ones because it's like, you know, this is very low level stuff we're dealing with here. So it doesn't have the, it's not as straightforward to use as a lot of debuggers, but this is giving me all the values of the registers and stuff like that, which is about as much information as you can really ask for, which is really fantastic. Uh, and that's pause there. I can also step over like you would in anything else, step to the next line, press play to let it just continue for going. And we see this is just gonna keep ticking over on, off, on, off. Um, I can also, set some breakpoints down here see if that'll hit it will that work huh that did work before huh not sure why that's not working now oh maybe it's because i had already paused at another breakpoint but if i stop it and start it again and that's running yep so i should be able to set another breakpoint here yeah there we go let's hit that breakpoint and that stopped mid execution which is super cool and i can see all the state of everything here um so yeah, that's amazing. I love it. This is fantastic. Uh, it's like a whole, it's opened up a whole new world of possibilities for me for debugging stuff, uh, which I absolutely love. It's one thing I did find, always find tricky before with Arduino stuff was debugging and stuff like that. And even programming it, uh, this command like cargo embed or clicking the run button here hasn't failed for me once. Now I haven't used it hugely in anger yet, but it has yet to fail once. Whereas I used to find with Arduino stuff, it'd forget the COM port, it'd lose, it'd lose the connection the uploads would inexplicably start failing for no reason. Plug it out, plug it back in, it would work again. Haven't had any of that happening, not once, um, which is a real breath of fresh air. So absolutely love that. Um, I don't know if this is what the embedded world is actually like in real life. Maybe real embedded developers are like, yeah, of course, that's how it works. <laughs> but I don't know. Um, for me, this is fantastic. I absolutely love it. So yeah, that's just a little bit about my developer setup for this. This isn't anything crazy. I'm not doing any wild programming here. Haven't done anything really in anger with this yet, but I plan to leverage Rust because I absolutely love it to do like more complicated stuff. Uh, and yeah, I'm just generally really, really happy with this. So yeah, big thumbs up for all this stuff. <laughs> I absolutely love it. So that's about it for this project. We haven't done anything groundbreaking here. We've blinked an LED ultimately, but I think the way we've gotten there is pretty cool. Uh, designed this board from scratch, uh, had no idea if it was gonna work and it does work. I also programmed it with Rust using a tool chain that I've never tried before and honestly really happy with just how smooth it went. Um, so I'm gonna leave it here for this project. This board is gonna show up in loads of future stuff and I'm sure I'll have way more videos about programming and Rust on uh, an embedded platform. But yeah, we're gonna leave it here for now. Um, thanks to JLC PCP once again for supporting me and sponsoring this video. Um, and thank you guys for watching. Um, yeah, so we'll leave it there and I will see you guys in the next one.